Live from the Election Zone, here's Nadine Habib. Welcome back to Rye Votes, the Ryersonian's live election special. I'm Nadine Habib, keeping you updated on breaking election news tonight. With just minutes left until the polls close, we'll be getting results soon. When we have more information, we'll be bringing it to you right away. Polls in the Mary Times closed earlier tonight and the Liberals came out with an early lead. They're po they poised to sweep all 32 seats in Atlantic, Atlantic Canada, according to unofficial results. Is this a sign of things to come? Stay tuned to find out. But before the final numbers start rolling in, let's take a look back at how Ryerson students did their civic duty. 1,400 votes were cast on campus, on campus advanced polls two weeks ago. Even more headed to polling stations today. Students living on campus voted in the Toronto Centre riding. Let's check in with Victoria Chan in the newsroom for some more information. Victoria, we're so close to seeing how the rest of the country voted. How do things look like right now? Thanks, Nadine. So we are still waiting for the local poll results to come in for Toronto Centre, so I can't give you much of an update right now, but what I can do is give you some background information on the riding. So a little bit about this riding, it covers the heart of downtown Toronto and includes neighbourhoods such as Regent Park, Cabbage Town, Church and Wellesley, parts of the financial, financial district and of course Ryerson University. Um, one really interesting thing to note is that it's been locked down by the Liberals for over 20 years. Um, during the 2012 electoral redistribution, the riding lost some territory to University Rosedale and to Spadina Fort York. Now, a lot of people were making a big scene about this because that redistribution removed Rosedale, which is one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city. What this means is that the NDP could have a shot of getting this seat. Um, now, the current Toronto incumbent, Liberal Christy, Christia Freeland, is now running um, in the new riding of University Rosedale. So with her out of the picture, a lot of people are saying this could be a two-way race between the NDP and the Liberals. So um, as we wait for the votes to come, we'll see um, whether Linda McQuaig, um, the NDP candidate, and Bill Morneau, Liberal candidate, um, who has a shot of winning this. Um, obviously, we can't forget Colin Bacon from the Green Party, Julian DiPatista from the Conservative Party, um, and um, we'll have more updates for you shortly. Back to you in the newsroom, Nadine. That was Victoria Chan joining us live from the Ryersonian newsroom. Meanwhile, let's check in with Kia Berkeley at Liberal candidate Bill Morneau's results party. Kia will be giving us some more background information on Bill Morneau. Hi, Kia. Hi. So can you give us some um, background information on Bill Morneau? Yeah, so Bill has been around uh, the Trump Center neighborhood for quite some time. He's been a volunteer in the neighborhood for about 25 years. Um, he's got a wife and four kids that they're raising here, and currently he is the executive chair of Morneau Chappelle, and that is a human resources consultant, and that's a family business of his. Now, a lot has been made, especially by Linda McQuaid of the NDP, of the fact that he's the former head of the Stephen Howe Institute, which is a nonprofit policy research board. Uh, some people would use it to say that he's just another business man, he's not in touch with the people. Um, but he's also the former chair of St. Michael Hospital and Covenant House. Um, some of the platforms that he's running on with the Liberals that might interest students are they want to quadruple the public transit funding, uh, they want to tax breaks for the middle class and an increase for the wealthiest Canadians, and they want to create 35,000 more jobs under the Canada Summer Jobs Program. Okay, well, what's the mood like uh, over there? So as you may be able to hear, it's getting a little more noisy, it's getting a little more crowded in here as people start rolling in. Uh, we're still watching the results come in from the rest of Canada on a big screen, and people are excited because the Liberals are doing well in Eastern Canada. And uh, yeah, the mood is just, it's pretty buoyant, and there's new people coming in every minute, so it's really starting to pick up. All right, thanks so much, Kaya. Next, thanks, we'll hear from you later. Thank you. Thanks. Next up on Issues That Matter, Alicia Gridkowska explores what the parties are doing about tuition fees. Alicia? Welcome back to Issues That Matter. Tuition fees and debt are major concerns for students, especially as both are on the rise. Listen to what Ryerson students have to say about tuition fees in Canada. I think we're uh, paying an arm and a leg. We're not even get a guaranteed a job after school's done. 
and like I still know people that are 22, 23 still working at a grocery store with me. I, know, I just feel like being in Canada, we should have free education. And a lot of countries in Europe have already gone towards it, especially in Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, Austria, in Spain, they also have subsidized tuition. But here in Canada, we're so, so behind. I mean, you do have countries in the world with cheaper tuition fees. But I feel like with Canada, it's not like the United States where it's over the top, over exaggerated with the fees. You know, we don't pay, well, a lot of us don't pay over 100,000 a year. Or Statistics Canada preliminary numbers on tuition for the 2014 to 2015 academic year show an increase of around $200 on average across the country. The most re recent average fees are around $6,000. The parties have addressed rising fees as well as student debt in their platforms. The Green Party would abolish all post-secondary tuition by 2020 and they would also introduce debt forgiveness for federal loans above $10,000. The NDP plans to invest $250 million in federal grants over four years and eliminate student interest on loans. The Liberals, on the other hand, will ensure that no federal loans have to be repaid until a student is making above $25,000 a year. And finally, the Conservatives. The party would eliminate in-study income for the Canada Student Loans Program Assessment, meaning students could earn money without it affecting their eligibility for loans. Which party do you think has the best plan for students? Check out our website, ryersonian.ca, and tweet at us with the hashtag RyVotes to let us know what you're thinking. Nadine? Thanks, Alicia. Angus Mulroney is on the phone with us again from the University Rosedale Riding. Here, he is from NDP candidate and Jennifer Hollett's election party. Hi, Angus. Hi, Nadine. So Jennifer Hollett used to be a host on Much Music, um, on much music, actually, what has her career been like since then? Yes, it's a it's quite an interesting story, actually. I interviewed Hollett for a piece on the riding at the start of the school year, and yes, it's true. She was a host on Much Music for a solid five or six years, and she interviewed all sorts of different people in music and entertainment. But she told me that one of the biggest interviews that really impacted her career was interviewing Jack Layton. Uh, after interviewing him, she became very interested in social activism and did a lot of interesting sort of social activist pieces for Much Music. And when she decided to leave that institution, she continued on in a career in broadcast journalism, but decided that her passion was really in uh, changing uh, society. So she decided to re-enroll in Harvard University, where she did a sort of political science course, and then decided to move into politics from there. So this has really been something that she's been interested in for a long time. And uh, yeah, we will see as the evening continues to progress if she will take the MP spot. All right, thank you so much for the update, Angus. Absolutely. Now, Victoria Chan has another live results update for us from the newsroom. Victoria? Thanks, Nadine. Now, before we start giving you the local poll results, I want to talk to you about Spadina Fort York. Now, it is one of the new 11 ridings created by the 2012 Federal Electoral Boundaries Redistribution. This is a very hot topic, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, some background information about the area. Um, it spans a large portion of downtown Toronto, including Toronto Island and Liberty Village. A really interesting thing is a lot of people are saying this is going to be a two-way race um, between the NDP and the Liberals. Now, if you see these two people, we've got two familiar faces here. Um, Vaughn, Adam Vaughn over here, is the liberal incumbent of the riding. Um, he's competing against Olivia Chow, so we know who that is as well. Um, Chow served as MP for this riding between 2006 and 2014 when she stepped down to run for mayor of Toronto. We all know what happened there. Um, following Chow's resignation, Vaughn won um, a by-election to replace her in 2014. Interesting fact, he actually um, beat Olivia Chow's executive assistant in this by-election. Um, and a really 
only fun fact here, prior to serving as MPs, both um, candidates were also longtime Toronto councillors in the area. So these people are obviously no strangers to Spadina Fort York. Um, a lot of people are saying it's definitely going to be a hot battle between these two. Um, we're going to have to see what happens. I'll definitely be giving you more updates. The next time you see me, I'm going to have results for you. Back to you in the newsroom, Nadine. Thanks, Victoria. Now, before we turn to our field reporter, Kira Bakim, we're going to look at some national results that have been coming in. As you can see in Halifax, Andy Fillmore is still leading with 13,000, more than 13,000 votes. And at Madawaska Restigouche, Rene Arsenault is, continues to lead with 7,555 votes. Now we're going to turn to Kira Rakim, who's waiting for results from Spadina, Fort York. She joins us now on the phone. Hi, Kira. Hi, Nadine. So this is a very urban riding. Um, do you know some of the Liberal candidate Vaughn's weaknesses? So uh, Vaughn, one of the, his biggest weaknesses, or, or according to Hundis, one of his biggest weaknesses is that actually he voted yes on Bill C-51. Uh, along with Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. And, and for a lot of people that live in this riding that are a little more left-leaning, that is a problem. And, and a lot of people are saying that that may be his weakness in this race, is uh, his need to toe the party line, so to speak. Okay. And uh, we're just wondering here, what's the atmosphere there like? Well, it's getting really busy now. It's past more volunteers are coming in. People are drinking. There's lots and lots of noise. It's, it's getting pretty, pretty raucous here, but we haven't gotten any any results yet. We're still waiting on results, and we're still Olivia has not yet arrived. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay. people are seem to be having a good time. Volunteers are here. Everyone's everyone's hanging out and eating good food and drinking some beer. So it seems like a good place to be right now. Sounds great, Kira. We're looking forward to the final results. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. Thank you. Now, Peter Goffin joins us now with more from our live panel of experts. Peter? Thanks, Nadine. Now, the niqab, a head covering worn by some Muslim women, has been a major talking point in this election campaign, much to the chagrin of many voters. Now, I'd like to ask you, panel, what has the impact of the niqab debate been on this election? The effect has been is that it's a complete distraction. Um, it's a strategy by the Conservative Party. I think that's kind of widely accepted. And uh, yes, it's an issue for maybe Quebec, but it's not a national issue. It's, it's not people's housing. It's not you know their quality of life at all. It's not their income. It's a real distraction. I agree. It's a distraction, and I think it's one that has really come back to bite the Conservatives because I think. Oddly enough, it's been an issue that's actually polarized the nation and brought a lot of people out to vote, and they've maybe lost some seats over it, so. Well, I think it is a distraction. It has polarized the country. I think it's it's very strategic on behalf of the Conservatives. They are appealing to their base, and they're trying to win back these Quebec seats, and this is a very, very intended like target that, that they're going at with this. But it's a non-issue, and it's an issue that's taking away from other very important issues that we're no longer discussing, such as missing and murdered Indigenous women in this country. So we haven't heard about this for weeks on the campaign, and Mr. Harper chooses to not address them, yet we're talking about a non-issue. Uh, in this when, you know, very few people are actually, you know, having this kind of outcome out there in the world. Absolutely. And, and I mean, one of the pledges that Harper has made uh, is that he would consider banning uh, niqabs amongst federal uh, employees. But uh, to put that in perspective, um, a 2011 uh, study found that only 1.8% uh, of federal employees are even Muslim women. And of course, only some of them would even consider wearing the niqab. However, that said, I think whether it's 2% or it's 100%, having any kind of legislation that bans women or anybody from wearing a religious garment or anything at all, I think is an issue, especially in a country like Canada. Mm -hmm. Now, so I just uh, wanted to shift gears a little bit. Sean, uh, there is a very unique situation in which Stephen Harper could, in fact, retain his role as prime minister, even if the conservatives don't have the most seats. Right. So by convec uh, convention with our constitution is that the prime minister will remain prime minister even after the election results are in. It's up to the prime minister to actually resign and to concede to another party, at which point the governor general would seek out a leader to replace him. But it could be if Harper at the end of the night says, you know, this is a very close minority and I think I can still get the support of the House. He could very well remain the prime minister, even though he has uh, not the majority of the seats in the House of Commons. 
Absolutely. Very unlikely, though. We've heard the key, the Liberals and the NDP quite forcefully say that they will not tolerate any bit of Harper. So it seems like he's gone, no matter what. Of course, some polls in other elections, most notably the United Kingdom, uh, has be, have been wrong. Um, so we'll have to see. And Nadine, uh, back to you. Thanks, Peter. Now we go live with an update on Eglinton Lawrence, where we're th where with uh, our reporter Adina Ali. Hi, Adina. Hi, Nadine. So how tight is this race in Eglinton Lawrence? It is very tight, um, mainly between the conservatives and liberals. Uh, liberal candidate Marco Mendocino has been leading ever so slightly throughout this entire campaigning period. Um, in fact, the liberals have always dominated the Eglinton Lawrence riding since its creation in 1979. So it will be really interesting to see if they can recapture this riding from the Conservatives tonight. Great. And uh, can you tell us more about the environment there? It's getting a little louder, a little, uh, I don't know, that's partly because of the, the Jays, probably that. Um, but it is getting a little busier, and we are still waiting for Joe Oliver to arrive. And so can you tell us a little more background about Marco Mendicino? Of course, yes. Um, so Marco has been quite the surprise in this race because he's really been the biggest challenge to Mr. Oliver. Um, Mr. Mendocino is a lawyer running his own practice and was a federal prosecutor for nearly a decade fighting against organized crime and terrorism. In fact, he helped put away Canada's first would-be jihadist, wow. the so-called Toronto 18. Thanks so much, Adina. That's, um, we're going to have to come back to you for more information later. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Now let's go to Alicia Birdie. Hi, Alicia. What's trending tonight? Thanks, Nadine. Welcome back to the Trending Corner. For those of you just joining in, we will be answering your questions and following up with you on social media through Rye Votes. Tonight we are taking a look at what has sparked up a conversation on social media during this year's federal election campaign. The hashtag Niqab of Canada has been ongoing on social media, allowing users to express their opinions after the Conservative Party said they would consider banning the Niqab during citizenship ceremonies and for those in the public service. The woman at the center of this controversy was Zunera Ishak. She displayed her, an, like actual anger because of this issue. She wasn't allowed to wear it during her citizenship oath this year after the Federal Court of Canada found the head covering to be unlawful. Now, Ashok became a Canadian citizen this Friday and was allowed to wear her niqab during her oath. But this conversation remains a hot election issue on social media after the Federal Court of Appeal dismissed the government request to ban the ruling. Now, CBC's senior correspondent, Sun Ormiston, tweeted, Zunair Ishak, citizen of Canada, wearing her niqab, emotional ceremony. And here's a picture of her here. For now, the Tumblr page, Niqab of Canada, is continuing to get tons of recognition. Vice found the person behind this Tumblr account here. Uh, Vivek Krishnamurthy is a cyber law instructor at Harvard University. Although he lives and works in the United States, he was born and raised here in Canada. He started a Tumblr account that features Canadians wearing similar gear to how the niqab is worn. Twitter users are adding to the Tumblr account's idea by showing their own ways of wearing the Canadian style niqab. This is how some users have responded to it. If you see here, this is kind of like the idea of wearing the niqab, except they're doing it with winter clothing. Here they're using their scarves. The niqab of Canada creator mentioned to Vice that inevitably all Canadians themselves in the public during the cold seasons wear a niqab and the issue should not be a controversial one. If you want to add to the discussion, all you have to do is follow us on the Ryersonian account and you can use Rye Votes. We can tell us how you think about the niqab, how you would wear it. Show us a picture, tweet us, we'd love to chat with you. Um, you can check out more on the Ryersonian's Election Zone website. We did cover a story about it later on or earlier on in the week and it tells you more about the Tumblr account so you can see many photos. Back to you. Thanks, Alicia. Now, before we break, we're going to take a look at the national seat count. So, as you can see, the Conservatives have eight seats, NDP three, Liberals 51, and Green is zero, as well as um, the Quebecois. <laughs> now, it's time for us to take another quick break. Keep following hashtag Rye Votes and let us know what you think of the results so far. I'll be back in five minutes with much more on this year's federal election.